Well, as it happens, I've been rereading Gibbon's The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire at the same time that I've been reading your book. Now, Gibbon's essential point, I think, is that when a civilization falls, if, if you could be said to have a point in something that's many volumes long in many years, is that, is that is that the collapse of a civilization can seem sudden when the barbarians are at the gates, but in reality it's the result of a long process of stagnation, political errors, and cultural decay of all kinds. Your point seems to be rather the opposite in civilization, uh, that civilizations can collapse faster than we generally think. Uh, leaving aside for a moment the ultimate question of whether we're going the way of Rome, do you see what's happening now? And by that I mean the whole toxic broth of news that's our lives every day in Western Europe, the United States. Do you see this as relatively sudden or is the result of factors that go back at least as far as the Second World War? Well, far be it from me to disagree with Edward Gibbon, probably the greatest historian of all time. But one of the points that I wanted to make in civilization was that Gibbon is one of those historians who has encouraged us to think of historical processes as quite gradual and slow acting. I mean, he, he covers about a millennium of history. Rome seems to take a thousand years or so to decline and fall. And I suppose the problem with that approach to historical change is that it encourages a certain complacency in us, a sense that, well, we have problems, but they'll probably play out over decades and possibly even centuries, so why worry? Live for the present. And what I tried to argue in civilization is that it's not actually quite like Gibbon says. To contemporaries, the decline and fall was not as obvious as the fall. And the decline is something that we only see really in retrospect. It's the kind of thing historians find out later, after the fact. Now, for us as contemporaries, while we have all, kind of all kinds of intimations of problems, I don't think the possibility of a very sudden fall is something we've fully internalized and come to terms with. And yet, the evidence is all around us that things do collapse rather than gently slide. And remember, this is partly the way that we think because we ourselves as individual human beings have a certain rise, a peak of our powers and then a decline and, and ultimately we, we, we fall, yes, we pass on glasses. and the reading glasses set in <laughs> and the teeth begin to go and you, you know, this is how we are. But it's not how civilizations are, it's not in fact how big cities or empires or states are. That these man-made edifices in fact, grow in a completely different way from organic entities like individual human beings. They, in fact, grow exponentially, and then they reach a kind of peak, and at that peak they're, in fact, surprisingly vulnerable. And then they can fall very suddenly and very steeply, rather than gently declining on that curve that we tend to assume. So part of the point of the book is to change the way we think about change and to make us much more aware than I think we are instinctively of the potential suddenness of disintegration or, or, or collapse, to make us realize that what happened to the Soviet Union, what happened to the financial system in 2007, 2008, what is currently happening to the European Union is the kind of thing that can happen to any complex adaptive system. It can suddenly malfunction. And things that we perhaps expect to take decades end up taking days. Well, I'm about to veer off because you mentioned the Soviet Union, and uh, I was there as a journalist between 1969 and 1972 in the Brezhnev era. And certainly, uh, any journalist, who t Western journalist, who tells you that they predicted the uh, the fall of the Soviet Empire. Uh, is lying. No one did. Uh, we just thought it was going to go on forever. And yet, you know, you're talking about you see things only in retrospect. And yet, it seems to me, and not in retrospect, whenever one wrote anything for an American newspaper about how, for example, Soviet science and economy didn't work except for the military part of the economy, people didn't believe it, and neither did our editors, because they would say, oh, what about Sputnik and all of that? But in fact, uh, you could easily say 
if you looked at the, the fact that that economy wasn't working then, and it never worked for consumers, that in some way the fall was inevitable the minute the little bit of terror was taken away, which is very different from what you're talking about because our Western society is not held together by terror. No, that's right, and, and there are profound differences. I don't want to suggest that we're about to have a Soviet-like collapse, but I think what we saw in the financial crisis was mm -hmm. the speed with which our system can malfunction. Uh, everybody in uh, 2006 and right into early 2007 in the financial business thought that things were just going great, and I even had an extraordinary mm -hmm. experience when a hedge fund manager bet me that there would never be another recession in the United States. Never? This was in early 2007. He made the bet. And I finally said, look, never isn't a great time frame for a bet. How about five years? Well, of course, uh, he, he, lost, uh, he lost his money. And I, I discovered the meaning of counterparty risk because I wasn't entirely <laughs> sure. And I was still waiting to be paid, I should say. <laughs> so this is really the way things uh, are, that, that complex entities whether you're talking about the planned economy of the Soviet Union or the very dynamic financial system that arose in the Western world over the last uh, century or so. I mean, the, these things have the potential to break down very much more rapidly than I think we, we tend instinctively to assume. And as I was writing the book, this kept coming home to me. As the West was ascending, which it did exponentially from around 1500, it kept encountering these other civilizations that were very fragile and collapsed almost as soon as they came into contact with the West. Think of the speed with which the Inca Empire or the Aztec simply implode. Uh, that's partly biological because they don't have resistance to European germs, but it's not just that. I mean, they turn out to be very fragile systems. Um, and in the same way, as the Western states expand eastwards, the great Oriental empires do really badly in, in com competition with them. The Mughals fold and mm -hmm. the British take over the whole of the Indian subcontinent. And although China remains notionally independent uh, as an imperial system in practice, it's econ economically hollowed out by the Western powers in the 19th century. And ultimately, the Qing Empire goes down in 1911, uh, exactly a, a century ago. In that sense, I, I think writing the book taught me an important lesson about the nature of the historical process, that we shouldn't think of history as cyclical, we shouldn't think of it as gradual or seasonal or in some sense biological, but we should rather think of it more in terms of adaptive, complex adaptive systems, the kind of things that they study at the Santa Fe Institute, which <laughs> have their analogues in the natural world. I mean, there are natural uh, phenomena that behave like this, but it's very interesting to realize that, that, that civilizations are governed by similar similar laws to these, these complex adaptive systems in the natural world. Well, you mentioned in your book that watching your own children grow up in England, you've had the uneasy feeling that they were learning less history than you, would learn, that, than you had learned at their age. And you write, quote, watching the financial crisis unfold, I realized that they were far from alone, for it seemed as if only a handful of people in the banks and treasuries of the Western world had more than the sketchiest information about the last Great Depression. Would you expand on that a bit and give me some specific examples of what you're talking about when it comes to the historical ignorance of people who are supposed to be world controllers. I have a kind of polling uh, system that I run. Every time I, I give a talk to an audience of people from the financial services industry, whether they're bankers or hedge fund managers or private equity guys, I always make sure that at some point in my talk I ask if they have read one of two books. The first book is, is Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz's Monetary History of the United States, which is probably the single most important book of financial history about the United States. And, and it contains an extraordinarily brilliant chapter called The Great Contraction mm -hmm. about the Great Depression in the US. Now, the other book is uh, Barry Eichengreen's book Golden Fetters, which is the international history of the Great Depression. Uh, it, that's the book that shows why a huge shock in the United States spread right around right. the world. Now, N nearly always, somebody has read one or other of these books, and typically, it's one person in a hundred. And that seems to me an incredible indictment of the way that we educate people. These are financial people that you're yeah. talking about, not not just anyone, but people these whose people business is money. Who usually are earning very large amounts of money from running or working for major financial institutions. The level of historical ignorance in the financial sector is 
absolutely astonishing. And what this means is that since most people who have entered that profession have never formally studied financial history, the only history they know is the history of their own careers. Now, since, <laughs> as I've worked out, the average career duration of a woman